more minutes until everyone uh, uh, arrives and then we'll, we'll start our second session. So please uh, bear with us, be patient. I think the, um, I apologize profusely for the, um, for the glitches, uh, technological cl glitches this morning, but uh, I think we're back on. We should be okay now for the rest of the duration of our, of our meeting. Um, while they are making their way uh, over, just a quick announcement that the, um, we have directly after the second session, the Vanuatu government is hosting you for a welcome cocktail. So it's just uh, drinks and some um, uh, drinks, uh, including kava, if you are game. Um, we dare you to try Vanuatu kava. Um, and it's, uh, it, 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 if it's anything, it'll calm you all down. Uh, not that you all need to be calmed down. You're all very calm. Uh, but it, it calms you down, and it's a, it's, it's a good um, relaxant for Vanuatu, and the most Pacific Islanders who take cover. Um, so please join us uh, if you dare. Uh, you, can't, you cannot have come to Vanuatu without trying Vanuatu cover. So uh, I dare you to try some. Um, and we'll, we'll start from 5.30 to 7.30. We have Vanuatu Songbird. Her name is Vanessa Kwai, who will be entertaining us um, this evening. So um, pray that the weather holds. Um, and um, we will, um, and also tomorrow, I'll just make a quick announcement now. They will, we'll pass around a, um, a, a little uh, um, uh, kind of like a sheet where you, you will decide whether you will be going to the, the, the Wednesday activities, going to the 83 Distillery uh, Island uh, site visit, and then also moving on to the, um, to the, uh, the Blue Lagoon swim in the afternoon. Um, if you can swim, uh, you will not want to miss the Blue Lagoon. We, we, we value the Blue Lagoon, it's really nice. It's a nice way to end a very uh, arduous um, two-day uh, meeting. Um, and uh, I would like you to enjoy the beauty of Vanuatu before you head back to your respective homes. Um, we will, uh, so the so on Wednesday morning, there will be uh, two buses waiting outside, take you to the distillery islands. Uh, the, the 83 Distillery Island uh, uh, factory. Uh, and then from there, they'll take you straight to Blue Lagoon, which takes about an hour drive. And then from there, we will have a, a lunch that the hotel will prepare for us. And then we will go for swims. We will have an afternoon tea. Then we will wrap up there and then take you back to your respective hotels. And then on Thursday morning, you're free. Most of your flights are Thursday afternoon. You can go for a quick shopping if you want, uh, or quick, quick sightseeing or whatever. Um, and then you come back for your uh, uh, airport transfers at around one, two o'clock. Okay, and uh, for those of you leaving on Thursday, those of you leaving on Friday, we will, uh, you, can, you can have Thursday off. And then uh, Friday, we will transfer you to, your, to, your, to the airport. Okay, so um, we will pass around the sheet tomorrow. Just, it's optional. It's optional. We don't. We don't want to force you to to go to that. But I mean, it's you might want to. Uh, I mean, if you couldn't have come to Vanuatu without enjoying a taste of our natural beauty. So, um, I think with those words, I um, I pass over to um, our moderator. So, unfortunately. Um, I, I, I want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Andrew Fong Toy for, for impromptuly uh, taking over from Ambassador Otto Tevi, who for some reason, Vanuatu's ambassador to the UN, he was denied boarding at the airport, so he couldn't make it uh, to, he was, he's very disappointed. He's asked me to convey his biggest regret for not being able to be here with you it's a, such a shame that his uh, buddy, Ambassador Faturi is, uh, no, Letu, Letu, Lutero is here and that he's not around to, uh, and, and of course, all of you. Um, 
as the ambassador, he would have loved to be here and 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 be part of the discussions. But um, and he's also the PCs chair, Civic Small Island Development States chair. So, um, he really, really regrets not. He unfortunately he forgot that he needed to um, uh, do his uh, ETA for tr transit in New Zealand, and then he was denied. <laughs> And then he tried to download the app, the ETA app, in the, uh, at the airport in JFK, but then he they they couldn't uh, he couldn't do it. They wouldn't allow him to. So he should he could have done it a week or two before. It's, he's learned his lesson. Right? Let's put it this way: it's, he's it's never going to happen again. Um, also, unfortunately, we we lost about four or five of uh, of our of our uh, uh, participants. Uh, they were unable to secure transit visas to Australia, so that's um, that's uh, it's sad, um, but um, it's okay. I think there's one or two of them I can see that they're following the through Zoom conferences. So I've talked enough now. I hand over to. Oh, and by the way, Ambassador Tanya is also one of the so the three participants from Cabo Verde could not be here because they couldn't secure uh, transit visas to Australia. So, um, and um, I think uh, one from Lisbon couldn't also join us because of that. Uh, so it's sad that they couldn't join us, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we, they can meet in the next, uh, meet with you in the next uh, SIDS National Focal Point meeting. Okay. I'll, uh, and and of course, Ambassador Tanya was scheduled to 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 chair this session, and I thank our very own uh, Juliet uh, Aqua, who is Vanuatu's focal point, and she's also the head of uh, our uh, M and E here. So she's it's well fitted to chair uh, the next uh, to moderate the 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 second session of our meeting. Over to you, uh, Juliet. Hello, everyone. Bonjour, tout le monde. Good afternoon, colleagues, distinguished guests, fellows and MPFs. Um, and yeah, welcome to our country. This is your first time in Vanuatu. Hope you are settling in. I know some of you are experiencing jet lag, so it's hard being an afternoon session on Monday. So we'll try and um, make this as you know as meaningful and interactive as we can. We have a lot of really interesting and diverse speakers with us this afternoon. Um, so I'm uh, really pleased and honored to be able to step in and help facilitate the session. I've already had a lovely introduction from my colleague, Barbara Mears, Mr. Sloven. My name is Juliet, and I work for the Office of the Prime Minister here, Governor of Manawatu. And our office, the Department of Strategic Policy, Planning, and Information, serves as an international focal point to run around the states. Um, so today's discussion centers on the critical periods of ethics, the integration of the ABIS international frameworks, and how ME plays a pivotal role in ensuring that full implementation. And as we all know, the ABIS outlines key priorities for sustainable development in SIDS. And when we are looking to turn these priorities into actions, it requires strong foundations, ones built on coordination, monitoring, and the ability to measure and progress effectively. So today's session this afternoon is actually quite important, and we heard uh, quite a few questions and comments from around the room this morning, but we are going to discuss more of these things in detail this afternoon. So we will now listen to progress from the Interagency Task Force of the Abbas, or the IATA, which has been diligently working and supporting coordination around the UN system. They will provide us with an update on the status of the MA framework that is the heart of the Abbas. Following on from that presentation, we will also have the opportunity to engage in dialogue um, through our national focal points. And it's really great to see so many of you from different countries around this region here with us, because we all want to know how we can better align our sustainable development systems and mechanisms with the others. We also want to figure out how we can collaborate more effectively with the UN system 
and other multi-stakeholders and uh, other agencies to improve our evidence practices. And all of these questions and the discussion today will help shape the future of how we can integrate others into our own national sustainable development efforts. So as we begin the session for this afternoon, I would like to encourage each of you to share your experiences, to highlight the successes, and more importantly, discuss some of the challenges we face and opportunities for moving forward. Together, through this exchange, we can continue to refine our approach and enhance partnerships between SIDS, the UN system, and other stakeholders that you can share here with us today, both virtually and in person. So with that, thank you once again for being here, and I would like to introduce our esteemed presenters. Uh, maybe before I introduce our presenters today, um, while speaking typically SIDS, and we're all accustomed to the needs of island time, um, and, you know, we're all looking forward to different perspectives from our diverse speakers. So in order for us to give them enough time and also have time to open it up so that we can have some dialogue together, um, I would just like to ask that our presenters keep their presentations for around seven minutes. Um, and then we also have time for some of the leading customers to come in and they will be given around three minutes as well uh, with their intervention. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this session. We have Ms. Tishka Francis, who is head of the SIDS program, the UN OHRLS. We have Ms. Anya Toma, who is the Economic Affairs Officer for UN NESCA. And we have Ms. Enetia Gagan, who is the National Focal Point for Trinidad and Tobago. And she is the Senior Program Manager of the Sustainable Development Technical Corporation Unit, which is housed at the Ministry of Planning and Development. Uh, and we also have um, Mr. Christopher Ryan from the UAS Cap. He's joining us online today. So, Chris, if you're there, thank you for being here. And I believe um, you have to also answer a few questions that we had in the morning session that. Um, they discussed. So just make sure that you pop that into your presentation when you have your strictly three minutes. Thank you. Now, without further ado, I give the floor to Ms. Francis. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this first presentation is actually going to be jointly done by Tishka and myself. Uh, we are going to focus on updating you very quickly on where the UN system is with developing the mandated monitoring and evaluation framework from the past. Uh, quickly, the presentation is going to focus on methodology, progress, and then give you a sense of our timelines and um, the operation is going to be happening around it. Uh, so, split it in half between Tishka and myself, so I'll take care of the first two, and then Tishka will come in on the last, and then on the last two, and then we'll do a very quick um, sort of wrap up. So, just to orient you on where we are, if any of you have read Abbas at all, there's a paragraph in there uh, which talks about calling on monitoring and evaluation framework um, for the document. And, and there's a little bit of very quickly history behind this. One of the uh, so-called shortfalls of the Samoa pathway is that there was no proper sense of how to, to, to monitor progress. Um, if any of you have ever seen the uh, Secretary General's reports that were done on the Samoa pathway, they were very, very uh, qualitative in, in style and approach, didn't really give you a sense of outcomes, achievements, progress. You saw a lot of things that said, oh, we spent this amount of money on this issue, but no result, none of that. And so uh, our, our, this time around, Member States decided that there needs to be a proper monitoring and evaluation framework, which will hopefully at the end of 10 years, give us a sense of how uh, it's an others have done with the implementation of ABAS. But I want to put it to you that that's just part of a, of, a, of, a, of a bigger thought process that needs to go in. So the, the key elements of, of, of the approach, um, there's going to be a quantitative assessment 
um, there's going to be a qualitative assessment and the focus is obviously going to be on tracking the progress and then the commitments in the section of the document that deals with how those things get there. Uh, the quantitative assessment is going to look quite similar to what you might be accustomed to with the annual progress reports, which is a statistical publication that is going to be done each year and discussed um, during HLPM. Um, and then there's going to be the usual, we did this and we spent that much amount of money in the annual uh, SG's report um, that will also come out uh, every August of, of, of each year. Um, we're going to be approaching the work um, in, 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 in three phases. Um, the first, which is currently underway, is a comprehensive mapping of uh, all of the relevant frameworks, et cetera, because this has made it very clear to us that this must not add any additional burden on their, their systems at the national level. Um, so, so with that, what we have started doing, or what we are in the process of doing, is mapping all of the relevant um, international agreements, um, the Addis Ababa um, Action Agenda, I guess the new um, FFD4 document comes out, that's going to come into play, Sendai, the new Kunming uh, Biodiversity Framework, all of them, um, we are taking, going through the process of looking through all of those documents to try and identify relevant indicators and map them onto ABAS to avoid any additional documentation, because these should be uh, indicators that member states are already tracking. And I will put the table up at the very end, which suggests otherwise. But the idea behind it is to not minimize the introduction of any new indicators that could potentially would be uh, member states. From there, there's going to be a political process, which I think will probably start when, when she comes in to speak. Um, where there will be a discussion among member states to sort of narrow down um, the, the, the targets. Um, member states have spoken about a four or a minimum set of targets um, that, that will be used to, to, to monitor our bank as we go forward. And once the targets have been identified, which is obviously a political process, we will then um, go to the identification of um, the relevant indicators that can be used to, to, to measure these targets. Um, um, uh, yes, so, so once that is developed, that is then also going to be discussed with member states, and then from there we will start the process in the information So the interagency task force has already been established. Right now, it consists of 33 uh, UN entities, um, which is quite a sizable group of experts to manage, but these are, um, uh, uh, these are entities from across the UN system covering all the relevant aspects of ABBA. The first meeting of the IATF happened you know, last month. Um, where there was uh, a sort of an orientation discussion um, at the beginning of, of, of a discussion around guiding principles, how this group is going to work. Now, um, there are plans, I think three is a big group to manage. So there, we are talking about identifying a core group of institutions that will do something in terms of the, the identification of the indicators as we go forward. Um, at all times, there is going to be a process of consultation with member states, which, Tis which Tishka will discuss um, when she speaks. But it is going to be a process where we also engage experts at the national level, our national um, statistical directors, offices, um, all of the relevant stakeholders um, who will need to come in on an indicated framework that is relevant um, to SIDS and that tracks progress that is important to SIDS. Um, the first, uh, as you know, the deadline is June of next year. Um, this indicator framework has to be ready um, by then um, for discussion uh, at, at next year's HLPF meeting, which is going to be in, in, in July uh, of, of next year. Um, the new format of the, of the HLPF session where the results of this indicator framework is going to be discussed, it's going to track a little bit more closely the, the way that the overarching HLPF is, is taken. For those of you that follow the HLPF discussions, 
they usually are around specific uh, SDG indicators. So the SIDGE session is going to start to track that a little bit more closely than it has in order to be able to report on and discuss um, what comes out of, of, of this new um, uh, e evaluation framework. Um, the technical work is being led heavily by the, uh, the UN Statistics Division, and it is going to be following very closely the approach that was taken um, for the identification of the, uh, for the, the targets and indicators for the SDGs. Um, as I indicated, there are going to be two reports um, annually, one which is a statistical publication and one which is more of the, the, the quantitative, the, the qualitative approach to reporting. Um, this is you. Yes. So I'm going to hand over to Tishka. Thank you, Anya. Um, so I, I think we covered a lot of the timeline issues already, but just to um, re reinforce that the work will be done by June next year, June 2025, we've heard for meiosis in particular, that this needs to be done by then so we can move forward. I, I think I alluded to that earlier this morning um, about the urgency of getting a monitoring and evaluation framework as soon as possible. So we have oriented our work around that and we um, intend to have the um, completion of the IATS work reflected in the annual report of the UN Secretary General on SIDS, which is, is due in July as, as um, Anya mentioned, so we can um, uh, consider it during the HLPF. So once once the, the information is included in the SG's report, we will have a political discussion in the context of the SIDS resolution in next year's second committee session. And to, uh, uh, we, to achieve this, we are doing the set of targets that um, Anya alluded to. Now, th this is a, a, a very much a political exercise. It's informed, of, uh, again, by um, technical work, but um, SIDS have also told us that they don't want a, a bunch of targets or indicators because these this is a very difficult and onerous process for them to get through. So we will um, narrow that down for discussions within the AOSIS by November. That, that is the um, timeline that we're working with. And following that, again, we will um, work on the indicator framework to be ready by early 2025 to allow sufficient time for the validation exercises that um, we alluded to earlier um, already this morning. Now, um, with respect to the outreach, thank you. We, we of course, recognize the importance of regular outreach and consultation, not only with member states, but with other stakeholders. Um, we plan to formally consult um, AOSIS at the key moments, including on the, uh, the targets and engaging um, representatives of national statistical agencies, planning ministries, um, and, and that will include, of course, the national focal points. Uh, we will convene regular briefings with all member states um, following achievement of IETF milestones and or as needed um, to update on progress and seek input as, um, as needed. And this will include um, uh, all member states and hopefully um, member states can coordinate themselves um, to bring in the, their their SIDS invoice if they if needed um, to contribute to the process, but with the process of of um, making the member states aware of these meetings will be very transparent and, and everyone should be aware of when we have these meetings. We were looking to have the first meeting in um, early October with the member states, um, but uh, of course it's early October now, but we, we won't um, wait too long to have it, but we just wanted to have a little bit more concrete information coming out of that mapping exercise before we um, uh, engage the member states. So we will probably, hopefully in the coming weeks, alert you to that, um, the, the, the date for that meeting. And of course, we will keep the national focal points in the loop with that as as well. Um, 
the terms of reference for the IETF, it does include um, provisions for the participation of the civil society, academia, and the private sector with the relevant expertise. And they will be consulted in a targeted manner on targets and indicators. So they not, may not necessarily be in the bro broader uh, meetings, but as we need them, we will engage them um, to ensure that we have those um, specific information captured. And we will also briefly meet with a few um, uh, uh, other stakeholders to gauge um, experience uh, and information for developing the ME framework. I believe we would have ODI, uh, uh, we have already engaged with ODI. Uh, so these are the kinds of um, engagements we're looking for to really get a robust um, framework. I believe um, Emily from the ODI should be talking later in the in the next part of the session to see how uh, that kind of engagement can be fruitful for our discussions. And we've already engaged the regional commissions and, 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 uh, and Chris should be able to um, speak to that as well. Um, we speak, we will speak with the RCs during the um, upcoming global resident coordinate, uh, coordinator retreat that should be on 17th, yeah, 17th of October to help them build support for the new framework um, uh, and across the national level as well and discuss more opportunities for them to engage. Um, and this meeting, of course, is an excellent opportunity for the NFPs to really um, think about that, the role of, of their role in developing the re uh, reporting mo and monitoring framework and to um, engage uh, once it's developed and implement. So the key points from this discussion will definitely be taken back to the IATF for, for the work, for their work. Um, so I think, Annie, you wanted to put up a, a screen before we um, finish. But basically that's the overview of where we are with the IATF process. And um, uh, you, okay, I'll hand it back over to Annie. So we're going to put up a, a, a table um, which was prepared for us by, by our regional commissions about two years ago um, when we attempted, when we did a, a statistical analysis of the progress on the Samoa pathway. And there's a bigger point that we want to make in terms of, of, of this issue of monitoring and evaluation. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you about what that is very briefly, very quickly. The point being, we can develop the best possible monitoring and evaluation framework for you. But if, the, if there's no data to put into that framework, you're gonna get something that looks very much like this. The, these were some indicators. These are indicators all from the SDGs. Each of, each of the, each of the, Dots represents um, an island, uh, our SIDS members. It is grouped into AIS, Caribbean, and the Pacific. The gray areas are where there's no data whatsoever for our countries. This table is two years old. It's not an old table. Um, if you look at some of the key areas that are uh, important to our economies for SIDS, if you go to, there's a, there's a, a tourism, uh, there's a tourism one there that measures. Tourism by GDP. You had it just now. Most of our islands do not have data for that. There's, there's a poverty indicator. We talk about poverty reduction. Most of our countries do not have data for it across the board. You look, we're talking about blue economy. If you look at the, at the indicators dealing with oceans and seas, most of them are grayed out. As I said, colleagues, this is a two year old table. So your M again, I'm just gonna say it again, your m and &E framework is only as good as the data that goes into it. If there's no data, you're gonna get something that looks like this each year as, as, as time goes on. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much to Tishka and to Anya.
for the combined presentations. Um, and it was really interesting as well to uh, have some insights, also to see what's come through transitioning from Samoa onto the Abbas, um, taking some of those lessons that you've talked about, and also to get a timeline. I think that's also really important for all of us as we're doing our planning as well in our respective countries, looking at the phased approach and um, just at the appreciation that the IATF is also trying to work in line with how countries are actually managing their own internal processes. Um, I think we'd like to turn to um, Kenitha now for her presentation and some insights from her. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, and thank you to the presentations from Anya and Tishka. So I was just quickly going through my presentation and I'm wondering if I should continue. <laughs> because um, I see that um, some of the groundwork have already been started in terms of doing the assessments. And that was one of the things that um, I thought of was very critical for us to, um, to start with. Because I remember when we um, were getting very close to doing the Samoa Pathway Report, um, there was a consultant that was hired that started to look at a uh, ME framework, start developing an ME framework for the Samoa just to allow us to be able to um to report. And I'm wondering to what extent the work that would have started in that framework, if we can do an assessment to get a sense of okay, indicators that were developed that were relevant to SIDS how much of it is actually relevant for the ABBAS that we can actually utilize. Because I think even at that point, there were some um, indicators that had to be, um, that were new because the SDGs didn't cover, um, wasn't covering those um, issues within the, the um, framework. So I think that is one place that we can start as well, in addition to looking at um, what currently exists, but also looking at work that would have started with the Samoa pathway for reporting and see how we can now um, transition that into um, the Abbas as much as it is um, relevant. So, um, sorry. So there um, may not be relevant um, indicators on the uh, specific targets that can be used in terms of the SDGs, um, but the target itself might be applicable. So that was something that um, I was looking at as well, because we have, uh, in as much as we, not, we do not want to um, create reporting burden, and we want to use what is existing and we're looking at what the SDG framework has, we may not be able to match indicator for indicator in terms of what we want to measure in the ABBAS, but there is a particular target under the SDG framework that we can use and then probably develop an indicator um, for that. So using that um, as an assessment as well. And once we have a complete framework of targets and indicators for the ABAS, I think that is where the multi-country offices um, come in and the work that they do with the government counterparts in identifying our data providers, data producers, and all the other activities related to data collection. Um, it would be important to start working on the data producers to support um, what needs to be done because if based on the assessment that we, Anya just um, had on the screen that shows where data isn't available, then we definitely need to start looking at data providers, data producers um, on the ground. So who has the data? Um, can they produce the data? What support do they need for data collection? Because one of the things that we're trying to do in Trinidad and Tobago is work with um, an academic institution for doing a compilation of SDG indicators. And it is expensive. And for the past, I think, two years, I've been trying to get resource mobilization, trying to work on getting the funding to do the resource, um, to do that um, project. But it's coming up a bit, it's, it's a bit challenging. So even that is the issue as well, because if we do, uh, we have to take that into consideration. If we do 
identify new indicators. We also have to identify the resources in terms of funding to support the data collection for those um, indicators. So that is going to be something that needs to be considered as well. So another thing that I wanted to touch on is, <clears throat> sorry, um, consideration should be given for the frequency of reporting. So when we had the technical um, workshop in Samoa earlier this year in March, the recommendations coming out of that meeting was for once we develop the ME framework for the ABAS, that we said should be encouraged to provide a report um, in 20, 20, 2028 um, ahead of the midterm review in 2029. And this is something that I want to revisit in terms of a recommendation, because if we basically starting from a place where data is an issue, then I think we probably need to be testing um, those waters a little earlier than 2028. So if it is that it's we can um, kind of create a cycle of reporting for every two years, and I guess in the period now, it will probably be 2027 before we get to the midterm um, in 2029. And then to, um, every two years after that, at least doing it in 2027 gives us a kind of a baseline as to where we are in terms of data. So at least to 2029, there are certain things that we would have to put in place. At least it gives us enough time to put those things in place because we know we have issues with resources. We have issues with institutional mechanisms and it takes time for those things to be implemented. So waiting until 2028 to do, to do start doing a report in anticipation for the midterm review in 2029, I don't think it gives sits enough time to do any sort of um, course correction and putting things in place once you do a report and identify what the gaps are. So all things being equal, um, should we have an m &E framework before the end of 2025? <laughs> I propose that it should attempt to at least do a first report in 2027. Um, a lot of resources are going to be poured into strengthening capacity and establishing strengthening institutional mechanisms. And reporting in 2027 allows us to assess readiness for the midterm review. And it gives it sufficient time to fill gaps in terms of capacity, um, data collection, and so on. And course correct and mobilize any additional resources that might be needed. And maybe even adjust um, the scope of the report because reporting should continue um, thereafter. So in as much as we are very ambitious and we want to be able to show progress on everything, we may not have the capacity or the resources to do so. So in doing that first report, that even that um, gives us some information in terms of, okay, can we really make an attempt to report on all of these things? Should we then um, readjust our scope and focus maybe on some core and critical things um, that we do have um, data for. So anticipating um, the reporting process provides an opportunity to identify challenges, gaps, areas needing improvement, and preparing these reports generate valuable lessons and evidence-based information that can be used for future decision-making. So this helps ensure that when the next reporting cycle arrives, informed decisions can be made based on insights gained from the previous reports. And I believe this is something worth um, considering. So um, my other contribution is looking at um, NFP's work on the national sustainable development efforts and support for existing international and regional monitoring frameworks and how this can inform the development of the ABAS m and &E framework. So one thing that has really worked for me is being both um, quote unquote SDG focal point and the national focal point for SIDS. So for example, we currently, and when I say we, I mean Trinidad and Tobago, um, working on establishing a sustainable development unit. And because I'm involved and leading in both the portfolios of work, I've been able to offer advice on how to incorporate the SIDS agenda into that institutional 
sorry, into that institutional frame, um, institutional structure. So in terms of drawing lessons from the Samoa part, we haven't been um, in that process and been part of that um, structure, understanding what are the lessons learned, com lessons learned coming um, out of that. As we now have the ABAS and we're now trying to make some headway in terms of putting institutional structures in place, I'm able to advocate and contribute towards what should be done and what are the things that we need to take um, into consideration. So I've been able to offer advice um, and also recognize that in the national context, what we had um, in place and when we had the Samoa pathway wasn't really fully integrated and it should have been and it wasn't widely discussed either in terms of implementation and achievement so that was something that is a lessons learned for us I mean Trinidad and Tobago so I think I think Carita was the one that was mentioning it in terms of there are people who are in it who know about it but then the, the people who needs um who it impacts isn't aware of it and i think that is something that uh, we are going to be working um a little bit more on in terms of disseminating information and making sure that the awareness of um abbas takes place so that we can have more um a more national um support for the implementation of it um given this um i've made a priority to ensure that the relevant authorities are aware of the SIDS agenda and the ABAS. So especially since it has replaced the Samoa pathway as a new program of work for SIDS. It's important to me that Trinidad and Tobago integrates this into everything that we do. So one of the key conversations I'm having at work is what, sorry, is that when I talk about SDGs, SIDS is always part of that conversation and it's always part of that discussion not as a separate conversation late, um, later on, but at the same time. So as we are developing systems or frameworks for monitoring and reporting on the SDGs, SIDS needs to be embedded in that process and keeping um, SIDS part of the conversation when we're talking about sustainable development is one way that um, that is being done. So we're also looking at how we can integrate SIDS into our SDG data repository online platform. And once it is up and running, how we include sit specific data is something that we're going to be discussing as we um, move along. So we would have received um, through the joint SDG fund, Trinidad and Tobago benefited from the UN system, helping us build our SDG data repository online platform. And we're in the process of going through the the operationalization of it. So once we be able to get the funding to do the project that we want for the data compilation and getting the indicators, that was going to feed into our data repository platform. And that would allow us now to be able to generate um, data for reports. So one of the things we did discuss is that now that we have this new framework, we have to be able to now use that platform to give us both um, both data. So we're also going to look at how we can integrate SID specific um, data into that platform as well. And we're also going to include the ABAS as we prepare the voluntary national review. So we're hoping that we are going to present our next VNR in 2026. And one of the conversations I've already started having is that we need to include a chapter within our VNR report on the ABBA. So wherever we are at that point in time in reporting is going to serve as the baseline for um, as we move forward to make an assessment. So at least we know what it is that we need um, should we be pre um, preparing a report in 2027. So ultimately, it's about understanding the local context and advising on how we move forward based on the information we gather from various meetings, workshops, and forums. So my role as NFP is to help adapt these global and regional agendas to our local needs, mobilize resources, and be an advocate for SIDS. 
so in my work, I aim to keep SIDS at the forefront of discussions around sustainable development and ensure it's always considered in decision making. I also believe it's important to maintain and strengthen our working relationship with the UN system. And Trinidad and Tobago has historically had a very good working relationship with our UN RC um, office. Um, and specifically the Ministry of Planning and Development, because we have the sorry, we are the line ministry for um inter international development cooperation. So I think that is a relationship to leverage in terms of getting the support that we need to move forward. So that partnership is crucial as we develop our approach to the SIDS agenda, especially as we move forward towards implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kanethia, for those really insightful words. And I think what's really interesting is you talked a lot about the processes going from a theoretical framework to something that's actually actionable. And you've used some really good examples. And um, it's a challenge for us, too, to have that on our discussion before us about how we actually want to report on SIDS and whether that means we integrate it into all the normal reporting platforms that we have. So thank you for that. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to hear from um, our first group of presenters for the session. So please join me in saying very big thank you to them uh, straight after lunch. And they did really great. So uh, now I'd like to give the floor to our lead discussant, Mr. Chris Ryan, who's joining us online. Yeah, thanks, moderator, Juliet. Very nice to see you up on stage there. Yeah. I, ho I hope you can hear me okay because we can hear you great now. It's a, it's a lot better than how things were this morning. So I, I trust the audio is coming through okay. Sorry, Chris. Sorry, we, Chris. We couldn't hear you. Okay. What about now? Yes, yes, yes Chris, yes, go ahead. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Now, it's okay when I talk, it's just an echo when you talk, but I'll, I'm, I'm going to trust it's working okay. So, yeah, th first, thank you to the presenters that already gone ahead of me for, for this session, for providing all the background information on what's transpired so far and what's planned for the, the reporting, monitoring and evaluation of the ABAS. Um, I don't have much time, so I'm just going to... Uh, give a few comments. I'm going to focus on the quantitative assessment, which is an area I was involved in for the Samoa pathway. And I'm assuming I'm going to be involved in that again for the, the ABAS. So as, as many of you know who are involved with the Samoa pathway, we didn't really have a an indicator framework in place to do the quantitative assessment until quite late in the process. So it was nearly with only two years to go that we finally had this indicator framework in place. So Given we're working on this now, and we should hopefully have something in place early on, what I'd like to do is just raise a few possible issues on how we might do things a little bit different from what transpired for the, the Samoa pathway. And it might help hopefully address some of these issues which we saw before with that little dot diagram that uh, Tiska displayed at the end of her little presentation. So there's three, three things I just want to bring up. The first is whether or not we, we want to provide the opportunity for flexibility for countries to, to tailor the reporting and thus the selection of indicators to their national circumstances centred around potentially a smaller core set of indicators. And this was something that was discussed a little bit in Samoa uh, in, in March. The, the second one is uh, the introduction of target values. So I'm not talking about the broader targets, which will be mapping uh, the indicators too, but the actual specific target values which countries might want to try and achieve against the indicators, similar to what countries are doing with the SDGs. We we didn't have any target values for the Samoa pathway, but uh, could we look to introduce those and, and tailor them to specifically for countries? And the third is the methodology which we, we look to adopt to, to measure the progress towards achieving the, the goals of the ABAS. Uh, we had to be a little bit creative last time round for the Samoa pathway because we didn't have target values in place. 
But if that's the case, I mean, we could look to, to a different approach this time around. So each of these things over the next few months as this work develops along the lines of the timelines, which we saw a little bit earlier, I think they just need to be discussed a little bit more. And I'm going to give you a little bit more information on each of those three, because I'd be keen to hear uh, some of the act reactions from the, the countries in particular on how we might tailor some of these things. So the, the first one I mentioned, it's you know, giving countries the flexibility to, to tailor the indicator framework to their national circumstances. And the, the downside of that is obviously it, it's going to be a lot more work. We're not going to have one indicator framework. We'll probably have a different indicator framework for each country. But the upside could be very, very big. And that is we're going to be able to tell a, a far better story of progress for each country uh, that captures the key elements of national plans, which aren't necessarily covered uh, by SDG indicators. So it's worth noting that currently, I'm focusing on the Pacific here, but currently a lot of the NDPs or national development plans in the Pacific don't include that many global SDG indicators. So if we develop the ABAS framework primarily on global SDG indicators, we are emitting a lot of very relevant indicators at the, the national level. So keep that in mind when you think about all those gray dots that you were looking at uh, a little bit earlier, because this is one possible way of getting a, a few more green dots up there on that chart. The other one is the introduction of target values. Uh, we didn't have target values for the Samoa pathway, but coming up with them for each country and giving countries the, the option to propose their own targets for each of the indicators. Once again, it's going to mean a lot more work, but it will make the, the progress monitoring of the, the ABAS for each country a lot more, more relevant. And the third one I just want to touch on is, as I said, the, the methodology for measuring progress. Uh, we have to be a little bit creative and just use a, a, a not a great approach for the, for the sub mile pathway because we didn't have target values in place, but uh, SCAP do have a tool called the National SDG Tracker, uh, which does the analysis for, for countries to, to show progress uh, on how they're tracking against each of, the, each of the indicators towards the SDG. And this tool could uh, easily be adapted to the, to the ABAS. So I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it there for my feedback on the, the potential monitoring of the ABAS, but I, I did get asked by Andy during the, the lunch break if I could just give a, a, a minute update on the, the indicator guidelines, which have been developed for the, the Pacific, if that's okay, Juliet. Um, so basically, this is a, a set of guidelines which SCAP have been working on uh, with the, the Pacific community, SPC. And there's a few key objectives we're trying to achieve with these guidelines. But one of, one of the key ones is we're trying to promote the importance of tackling indicator production in a little bit more of a holistic way uh, to try and minimise the burden on countries having to report against the SDGs, having to report against, for the Pacific, the 2050 strategy, having to report against the ABAS, and then they've got their own national reporting priorities where the, the centrepiece should be the national development plan. So that's one key thing. We're trying to also promote the production of better indicators, especially in national planning processes. So we're, we're teaching, uh, so we, we've come up with a set of guidelines to assess the, the quality of indicators so, so countries can monitor their, their national plans a little bit better. Uh, we're also touching on you know, how countries should tackle reporting against global and regional initiatives, such as the ABAS. Now, that part of the, the guidelines is a little bit empty at the moment because we still have to have these discussions over the next few months as to what uh, countries in the Pacific need to do to report against the, the ABAS, but we will certainly update that uh, in the next uh, few months. And the other little thing, which we're also trying to encourage countries to develop their own national indicator strategy, which basically reviews their whole indicator landscape. And that's a, an option for countries to pick up if they would, would like and would happily work with them. So that's once again, just doing a, a big sort of overtake or stock taken assessment of everything that's happening at the moment and seeing where things can be improved. And it's, it's, 
it's good timing for that with especially in the Pacific with the both the Yeb Bass and the 2050 strategy now creating these slightly extra burdens on the, the countries, trying to come up with a way in which it can be a lot more manageable. I know I've probably gone over my time moderator, but I'll I'll finish there. Thanks. Really good to hear from you in terms of those three key things that we should be thinking about now that we are looking at finalizing the ebony framework and how we want to look at targets and um, and what that means. So some really tangible suggestions there from you. Thank you. And also thank you for your brief um, explanation of the Pacific Indicators Guidelines, which came from a question this morning in the session. And I'm sure there's resources available if other people are interested to find out more information. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our presenters, presenters for that first part of the discussion. And uh, we'll allow a few minutes now to just open it up to the floor if there's any discussions. Um, I would ask that we just limit them to two minutes. And um, for those who are, have not spoken yet, please just introduce yourself and say which agency you come from. Thank you. Ambassador. Just uh, a number of uh, quick questions. On the first presentation, quantitative assessment in data-driven annual report. Can can we have clarification? What are these annual reports? Where are the sources of those? Where do they come from? Second one on qualitative assessment is the SG report. Why? And can we also uh, have some clarity around the information? Is it the information will come from regional, national report to frame and construct the SG report. So can we have clarification on those, please? Um, on uh, the presentation by Ms. Uh, Douglas, uh, well done. Um, I like your presentation. The question I have is on in Samoa, I think you mentioned, we, we did uh, look at guiding principles for indicators. Uh, how do you see those? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that those have been uh, taken through and perhaps uh, Tisha and uh, Anya can also uh, respond to that. But I think it's important. The, the thing that I noticed was that in the, uh, in the timetable, where do the inputs from countries come in? Uh, we're talking about endorsement. Uh, we're talking about uh, agreement on target, uh, et cetera. But I'm, I'm not hearing where inputs from countries uh, will come in because it, they need to come in in the framing of indicators and target and not just ask them to endorse or whatever. I don't think that that was the the spirit behind uh, the uh, meeting in, in Samoa. And then uh, just on your 2027 uh, proposal, I think uh, one of the things that we did recognize was that there are certain areas that will require a little bit more time to get the assessment right and therefore the timing needs to be a bit longer. So that's why we, we, we sort of look at that time frame that, that you mentioned. And I, I really liked your uh, suggestion in terms of uh, having a section in the uh, VNR on, on APAS. I think that's a good uh, proposal uh, moving forward. I have other uh, one or two uh, questions about uh, the presentation by Ryan. Uh, on flexibility, you say flexible to tailor to national circumstances. I, I fully agree with that. But you're going to, at the same time, you also advocate for the need to compare. Um, now, for comparison purposes, it's going to be extremely difficult if each country is not using uh, similar indicators. So perhaps I think in Apia, we, we've sort of felt that perhaps in those cases, we should have 
core indicators. And then perhaps the specific uh, context of countries can feature uh, later on. I think I'll leave it at there uh, because I think others would want to, but I have other questions as well, but I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll take uh, two more questions. I think Cuba, you have the floor. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, taking into account that this is the first time that I take the floor, I would like to thank the governor of Guantanamo for the warm welcome, and also uh, to thank the office of the OHRLS, it's a little bit difficult to <laughs> pronounce, for the all the help in the organization of this, this event. I would like to make some, some comments uh, that are regarding the monitoring and evaluation uh, activities taking into account the lesson learned from Samoa Pathways and also from the implementation of other uh, uh, sustainable development agenda. Uh, in this uh, meeting, well, nobody doubts the importance of monitoring and evaluation in order to, to be on track on the implementation of the development agenda. Uh, establish, uh, establishing effective monitoring and evaluation systems requires systematic efforts and overcoming capacity constraints, while the NNI uh, has improved over the time in SIF uh, and has clearly contributed to the follow-up of the sustainable development agenda. Results have been extraordinarily challenging due to, and this is still a problem for all the SIF, due to the data availability and the capacity to collect relevant data. This is a problem that we are facing, despite that we are advancing. So uh, the, and also the, the data landscape are highly uneven between the cities. Countries with rel relatively major economy have more resources to invest in national level data collection and management than uh, most of smaller economy where the public, where the public administration has limited human and financial resources. There, therefore, it's important to ensure that the evaluation activities take into account, and this is something that was mentioned, take into account the unique situation of each country. Here, not one size fit, fits all. We have to take into account the particular institutional arrangement, the, the organization of the government, the cultural system, the priority of each country in order to uh, establish the monitoring and evaluation system. Also, it's very important to promote the country-led monitoring evaluation will be, that will be uh, best served to the need of the country to manage sustainable development. Sometimes we, we look at the evaluation uh, activity as has to come from outside. So we need to, to, to realize that this is something that we have to own it as, as a country. Uh, and also the all the requirements of for the national level capacity building need to be also carefully incorporating in the development of the overall regional monitoring and evaluation framework this would include providing substantial financial resources over a period of time given the low starting point in many countries i have a question and taking into account that was explained and this is the process that we are going, we just start kicking off, uh, kicking on. How can, how can evaluation support for various external uh, founding uh, founders be, be brought together because this is dispersed. So there is evaluation support from different agency, but it's very dispersed. And I think that we need uh, to bring in a coherent package you know, from, his, uh, from his current fragmentation in order to help and in order to better use the the resources in a more efficient way. I think that this is, is, is very important. Uh, and also that uh, I think that we need to work together is to increase the cr cross learning between each other. This is also very important. Uh, there is existing mechanism that could be used for this pur purpose, including, for example, AOSIS, the interagency consultative group on seats, uh, and we can bring also together CARICOM in the Caribbean, OECS, and other, other organizations together. But I think that we need to 
to work, continue to work in a more coherent way in order to better use the, the resource that sometimes are not, uh, not available or are not there in the moment that we need it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe we'll allow some time for our panelists to uh, to give some feedback to some of those questions and comments raised. Uh, maybe I'll start on this side with Tishka and Anya. Um, thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I will start with responding to um, Amb Ambassador Lutheru's question around the two uh, reports. Um, that will now be coming um, out of out of Abbas. So, so the first, um, which will be released in time for HLPF, uh, is going to be your your quantitative type of report, similar to what you see coming out, as I said, um, for the the annual SDG progress report. It's going to be along those kinds of lines in terms of a, a, a statistical report, which is going to be led um, drafted. Uh, led by our regional commissions um, for that for that process in the same way that that um, they did for the statistical report that we produced for this this Samoa pathway that's where that dot table came from and and that's what Chris alluded to in terms of the challenges that they had the commissions had in putting together that report so that one will be released in time for HLPF and that will inform how we craft and, and the discussions that that go into the into the SID session because the um, Abbas resolution, if I'm not mistaken, talks about repurposing the SID session to more closely track to the HLPF as opposed to uh, the the sort of more policy oriented type of approach that we've been taking to the SID session. And then the the other report is your is the usual um, SG's SG's report, and that is where the more qualitative assessment um, for want of a better set of words is going to happen. Um, now that report is typically, um, as you know, ambassador, the inputs for that come from the UN system. They come from member states. If member states feel like reporting over the years, we have really not gotten a lot of inputs from member states. Most of the inputs from um, for that report has come from the UN system and from our development partners um, as well when they feel like reporting. Um, so, so that that particular report will remain, and that's where you'll see the types of programs and and the money that has been spent, and it will also cover some of the other mandates um, that we are often called upon to re report. So, if there's something on partnerships or the global business network, those kinds of things, that will go into that report, while the other one is is more of a statistical um, uh, publication. Uh, so, I hope that answers your question, Ambassador, did I? Okay. Okay. Um, and then I want to strongly agree with the comments um, that Cuba made in terms of, 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 of the challenges. Um, I want to, we have some MCOs in the room, um, the, the, which we can Put them on the hot seat and talk about the the need to drive coherence with with some of the support that's needed um, to strengthen statistical systems and and monitoring at at, at the national level and perhaps our, our our MCOs and RCs offices um, can take the floor and talk about how they can assist or what they have been attempting to do um, within within better than than us who are headquarter based um, um, can can sort of deal with. So I'll stop there, Madam Moderator. Um, nothing much to add there. Um, you covered the issues, Anya. Um, just to speak a bit on the resource mobilization um, piece, uh, we understand um, the challenges there very much. I think for the last maybe three to five years in, this, in the margins of the Statistical Commission, we've been having meetings around that very issue um, with Paris 21 um, taking the lead on um, uh, sensitizing um, partners on the need for uh, resource mobilization for the SIDS in terms of their data capacities and, and, produ and data collection. Um, so we will continue to work there. That might be one of the um, key takeaways of this meeting. Um, Kinesia, uh, uh, we can further discuss that as well, um, how we can take that forward. 
to ensure that um, we have frameworks for resource mobilization for this this um this kind type of work. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to give the um, chance to Ms. Douglas to just respond to the question that came from the ambassador, and then um, I might also ask Chris after that if you heard the question that came in about the um, data. If you could just give us a bit more um, clarity around that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Moderator. I think I may put Damien on this spot because he was at the um, session we had in Samoa, and I remember that we did develop the guiding principles that Ambassador referred to. Um, I guess the question would be to what extent those guiding principles were shared with the interagency task force for um, incorporating into their work and into their terms of reference. Because to a certain extent in Christopher's presentation, he did mention some of the things coming out of that meeting in terms of being flexible and adaptable um, in terms of national um, and in terms of sort of national and regional um, context. And so some of those elements were brought out in his presentation, but the ex the extent to which what was um, documented in Samoa was shared with the interagency task was, I think, um, OHR, LLS, DESA. <laughs> May have to respond, respond to that because, um, yes, I would leave that there. Um, in terms of the other question, I mean, um, Ambassador, I hear you in terms of the time frame and understanding that there are certain things that are going to take longer to um, produce. And I just, I mean, I guess within myself, I feel like at least do something so that you can know where you are. And in my mind, the things that you feel within, as a country, I mean, that you feel you're unable to um, produce reports, and then that's something that you don't attempt because you need more time to be able to put structures in place for reporting. But I don't think that because the things that would take longer, um, that need more time should prevent you from at least doing some sort of assessment um, at a certain point in time to be able to identify where you are, what is needed, because I think um, in as much as we have data that um, Anya would have presented that is two years old, we still need something for where we are now so that when we have any conversation about resources I and mean, when we have any conversation about um, what is needed, we're doing it based on the situation that is current and as is. So, so where are we now? Um, where are we by the time the um, framework is ready and we have to start looking at um, reporting, where are we, what do we need, um, what is available? And, and I think that um, that should inform the conversation going forward. And if we are able to, once the framework is up and running, start putting things in place and we're able to um, prepare a report um, to see where we are before, at least sufficient enough time before the midterm review, there are things that we can then put in place to, uh, I guess, give us a better footing for halfway there, where are we, and the um, assessment is, at least it takes into consideration um, attempts to put in place to, to, um, to correct things. Thank you. Um, and I am conscious of our time, but I do recall there was one point that was made also by the ambassador around indicators being flexible, but also the need to have comparability across different formats and how that would actually translate and be practical for SIDS countries. So Chris, in 30 seconds or less, um, did you want to weigh in on that? Keeping in mind that we also, session two is going to continue after afternoon tea. So. Yeah, thank, thanks, Juliet. No, I, I mean, oh, sorry, Chris. Uh, yeah, to Ambassador, I mean, your your interpretation of the discussion in March in Samoa is exactly the same as as mine. I mean, we we did we're certainly encouraging some flexibility, but we we we've got to have a core set. We can't let countries just come up with whatever set of indicators they want. So, so I want to come up with that sort of compromises 
the work that I think needs to be done over the, the coming months. So how big might that core set look like and sort of what uh, additions or modifications country might want to make to it is the, the challenge ahead. But it's, I'm interpreting things exactly as you did in, in March, Mr. Ambassador. After, 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 after come back, and we'll have an opportunity to have um, some more discussion together. So, on that note, thank you very much to all our lovely panelists today and our interventions. Chris.